All right, that is probably enough time. Um, so welcome everyone. It looks like um, people joining is starting to slow down a little bit. Um, so this is the um, WinAdmin's virtual user group event for October 2021. Um, got a couple things today. We're going to start off with, um, after a little bit of housekeeping, um, Don is here to present Windows 365, the cloud PC. Um, so pretty exciting stuff. I know she's been doing a, a little tour and she's got a lot of awesome um, stuff to say. Um, and we're going to end with uh, Patch My PC, who's going to do a little giveaway. Um, if you didn't catch that on Twitter, um, they'll talk about that a little bit at the end. I believe we're going to have um, Jordan come and talk about that. Um, in terms of housekeeping, um, session is recorded. Um, so if you have to drop out or you came late, um, we'll post it hopefully within the next couple of weeks after a little bit of editing. Uh, but uh, that also means that if you come off of mute, that you are potentially recorded. Anything in chat is potentially recorded. So if that um, is a problem for you, just keep that in mind. Um, just because of the number of attendees, we're going to keep folks' lines muted, and I think we'll go with the hand-raising approach. We've tried a few different, so we'll try that one this time. So if you have questions along the way um, that you want to um, talk to, um, you can raise your hand, and then at a convenient time, we'll try and sneak in there. If you'd rather put it in chat, um, we can try and cover that as we go, or we'll capture everything that's not answered at the end, and we'll share with Donna. And if she is kind enough, perhaps she will um, answer you after the fact. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing, and, and Donna, if you're ready, um, I want to give you as much time as possible, so I'll let you jump right in. Thank you. Let me just get a PowerPoint here fired up. Awesome. All right, so that's there. And let me just go ahead and share that. I'll just share that whole screen. I don't think I got anything nefarious displayed behind <laughs> there at this time. Um, so hello everybody. Oh, I can do I could do camera too if anybody wants to see that. Um, so hello everybody. I'm Donna Ryan, uh, MVP. Um, going to talk today about Windows 365, which is I think it's a pretty uh, pretty awesome awesome technology. Uh, it's got a lot of you know good practical use cases, and you know for it only being out you know out in the world for two months, I mean it's caused a little bit of a stir and. It's definitely something to be be well aware of. So, um, you know, you can follow me on Twitter at the Notorious DRR. Uh, I shouldn't have a .com on there, even though I guess I do have a web page for Notorious DRR, but that's a blog I rarely ever update. So, uh, if you want to find any of the content that I've written, most of that resides over at MSN Point MGR, uh, where you also can find my community tool Winwich. Uh, there's also a bunch of People that are much smarter than I am blogging over there as well. So good stuff if you if you have not perused over there. And so Windows 365. Well, what is it? Come on. There it goes. Awesome. Uh, so at a, at a, in a very small nutshell, it's personal Windows desktops hosted in Azure. Um, the emphasis on the personal. Um, what that means is if you're comparing that to a solution like Azure Virtual Desktop, Azure Virtual Desktop has multi-session systems, so you can have multiple users logged on to one machine sharing the resources. There's cost savings value to that, to going through there, but there also adds a lot of managerial headache. Um, which isn't insurmountable, but um, by doing it personal, it just means that when we assign this machine to this one user, that is their machine. Uh, and so they're not shared, they're, you know, persistent systems. Uh, Windows 365 does come in essentially two flavors or versions or SKUs. Uh, there is a business SKU and then the enterprise SKU. Uh, business is pretty lightweight. Um, the overall license cost is less because you're getting less. Really, you get a, a uh, Microsoft curated image on an Azure AD only joint machine on a Microsoft network. And that's about it. Um, sure, you could do some management. You can manually roll them into Intune, but there's 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 it's pretty basic by design. Um, what I'm, we're going to be focusing, though, is the enterprise. And the enterprise SKU brings Intune management, which is actually really cool. Um, it's the, you know, it, I, I've not seen an easier way to deploy uh, Windows 10 systems um, than I have with Windows 365. And I've been doing Windows deployment now for a little over 10 years. So I've been thoroughly impressed with how simple the solution is. Um, and you know, it's, it's easy to deploy, it, it really is. Uh, very, very simple. 
so who are the target audiences for Windows 365? Uh, well, if you're looking at trying to replace your computer fleet, uh, there's, you know, supply shortages on silicon or pretty much anything. Uh, so there are organizations, and I've been talking to a few, that are looking at extending the, the life of laptops and such that they were planning on cycling out because you just can't get hardware. Uh, so this could be, you know, one way of provisioning new systems and just you know extend the life of something that's existing uh folks that are going through you know mergers and acquisitions uh because of how easy and quickly you can deploy machines um you could start cranking these things out you know ready to go to to pride and you know 20 minutes or you know at, you know at least 20 minutes at least to provision and some policies to apply and so you know onboarding new new folks into this environment is pretty quick uh, so if, if you're going through those and need to provision you know, systems quickly for newly hired employees, Windows 365 may fit that bill. Uh, folks that have, you know, transient temporary workers or contract workers, instead of having to ship them a laptop and then get it back and try to maintain, just giving them access to a Windows 365 cloud PC uh, is a absolutely a viable option. You know, once their contract is done, revoke the license, user has no more access to the machine. Just that simple. Um, organizations that are looking to move to a cloud VDI solution, so looking at you know either you know uh, retiring those hypervisors stored in a data center, maybe you're tired of paying the Citrix tax, uh, plus RDS Cal's. I've uh, spoken with a, a fair amount of folks that were looking uh, at Azure Virtual Desktop uh, to fit that bill, and then. You know, bring up Windows 365, and it definitely has some advantages over AVD, uh, especially for those folks that are new to, to VDI. Uh, AVD is, yeah, it's as far as any other VDI type solution goes. I mean, it, it's it's pretty simple in comparison um, to maintain and manage because the underlying infrastructure to support you know, the, the user connections, the authentication, you know, the front ends, the gateways, that's all handled by Microsoft. So you don't have to architecture any of that stuff. Um, but you still need to, you know, have a good understanding and know how to maintain these systems, you know, power them on and power them off to save money. Uh, the user profile disks, the shares are we doing, file or Azure files, that app files, you know, there's there's a lot of things that go into it. Uh, and, you know, if you don't have or your organization doesn't have somebody, you know, on staff that's familiar with these types of principles, um, using Windows 365 as an alternative uh, can make a lot of sense where you don't have to really learn a new skill set, especially if you're already managing Windows 10 systems and now Windows 11 systems with Intune. It's just carries directly over. So what does this cost? Well, there's there's the, the you know, the, the big question. Uh, so when you look at licensing, then what do we need to have? Well, for enterprise, the user needs to have an Intune license, whether that's coming in through a, a, you know, an M365, M365 A class or an E class, or however you're getting it. The user does need an Intune license. So you know, typically, at least most of my clients are coming in here with like an M365 E3, which is more than enough to bring them up. Uh, but we need the Intune license for sure. Additionally, we need to have a Windows 365 license, and this license dictates the size of the machine that gets provisioned. So, you know, if we're, you know, I can show you some of the publicly available pricing charts, but, you know, essentially, if we're looking at like, an, uh, like a four gig or an eight gig machine with two cores and 128 gigs of RAM, I think that's like 41 bucks, something like that per month. Uh, if we need 16 gigs, we can buy an additional license that has those specs uh, associated with said license, and then we can apply that to a different user and then upgrade their machine. And so you know, whatever you buy can be upgraded, um, but it really comes down to that that license. Now that license is per user per month, and so it is it is fairly a la carte, but the, the big advantage to that is you have fixed costs. Uh, looking at you know AVD as a you know as a comparison, AVD doesn't have any fixed costs. Um, it's all consumption based. 
So the name of the game with ABD is power as much stuff off as you can in order to save money. Well, with Windows 365, you don't care because the, the cost is known and predictable. And so for some organizations, having a predictable cost trumps a variable lower cost. But on the other side of that, too, if your scaling script breaks or a service, you know, service account password dies, and these machines don't get turned off if they're on a consumption base. You could get a higher than expected bill because you, the service in place you know, maybe stopped working. So it, it's a you know, a cost benefit, uh, but there is a lot of advantage to having just a, a flat, uh, flat predictable rate. So what's the end user experience like? Well, it, it's actually pretty good. Um, we can connect in through an HTML5, HTML5 web browser, which is pretty much any web browser now. Uh, Edge supported, Chrome supported. Uh, Firefox, I think, is mostly supported. I think last time I checked, the file transfer option wasn't working in Firefox. That may have been resolved. Uh, but you know, uh, any, any old web browser will do. Um, on the app side, Windows has a dedicated remote desktop connection uh app um that also can connect into abd and so if you're if you're using both you can have all those resources in one app there are apps of uh, apps available as well for ios and for android so byod this totally fits um and the users can connect in through any one of those means and i'll, sh I'll show you the end user experience i've got you know system systems pulled up so you can actually see what it actually looks like uh, but it's, you know, you can access this thing from almost any device. And I guess lastly here, uh, well, second to last, I just got a chart here on the on the my last slide. So how is this managed? Uh, well, enterprise, it's in tune. And so you got your reporting, you know, your Windows update is going to be handled through your um, Windows update or WFB rings. Uh, same with feature updates. App deployment is going to be through Intune. Uh, security baselines, they have one published specifically for Windows 365. Uh, Endpoint Analytics has a couple of Windows 365 specific reports. Um, and there's even a, uh, you can now communicate with Windows 365 via graph. That's now out as well. So pretty much yeah, anything in Intune is, is generally going to work with, you know, a few, a few exceptions. Uh, and lastly, just to kind of give you the visual on what you get and the difference between the business SKU and the enterprise SKU, you know, the business is fairly limited. So no domain setup is a nice way to say AAD only, um, whereas Windows 365 today still has a dependency on, on the domain. Um, you know, you have a, a self-service troubleshooting reset in Windows 360 in the, the business. Uh, there is a troubleshooting tool as well for the end users in, in enterprise. I can show what that looks like. But real, you know, reality, there's not a not a whole lot there. Uh, custom images is a no-go with business. And so if you need to go down the golden image route, um, you, you get a lot more bang for your buck with the enterprise SKU if you're using Intune. And so um, since I am not a fan of slide decks, that's about as long as I like to make them. Uh, are there any questions or comments? You know, please feel free to um, throw them into the chat. I don't mind being interrupted. Uh, so whoever wants to, you know, is moderating the chat, you can throw throw out um, questions. Um, I do see that one one in here can be co-managed with um, config man on premises. Absolutely, I've actually got uh, co-management set up on all of my cloud PCs because I can. So what does this thing look like? Well, let's see here. And so oh, let me turn on zoom it here as well so I can zoom in. All right. And then I can probably do one of these as well. All right. Hopefully that's, you know, large enough that everybody can, you know, get a good idea. So once you've, you know, onboarded your licenses into your tenant, uh, you're going to get this guy showing up. And that is where Windows 365 is going to live. So we can go ahead and click on here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of walk through some of these options and kind of try to stitch them together and how this all flows. Um, you know, you got, you know, your typical dashboard. 
uh, your all cloud PCs is going to show you every, you know all of the systems, um, you know which users are associated. So here's me and my my two daughters. We all have a cloud PC, and my two kids aren't using them, but they're they're good placeholders. But you can you, know, you can you know, see uh, I thought they had a version on here. I guess not. Um, so how you get these things spun up in the first place, what you first need to have is an on-premises network connection. Now, like I said, as of today, Windows 365 is uh, hybrid Azure AD only. Uh, pure Azure AD is not publicly available. Uh, yeah, it's coming. Um, it was introduced into AVD almost about a month ago. And so since they're more, you know, Windows 365 is realistically just built on top of AVD, it's leveraging a lot of the, the functionality and behind the scenes infrastructure. Um, you can easily forecast that it should be here pretty soon, the pure AAD. But anyway, so to set up one of these, it's it's pretty straightforward. And I'll kind of walk through the wizard just to get a to get an idea of what options we need. And so first thing we're going to need to give this network connection a name. So I'm going to call this. And then throw it in your subscription. Resource group, just like most anything in Azure, I'll just go ahead and throw that in networking. And now at this point, we need to select a virtual network. So you'll need to have one of these set up uh, ahead of time. That's how it's going to get your IP addresses and generally show up in which Azure region is closest to that network. But really, that's about what you need to have, you know, stood up from a from an infrastructure standpoint. It's just a virtual network, and then the subnet. So we know where this thing is going to attach to. Next thing we need to know is how to join our Active Directory domain. So you know the common things: DNS name. So you know Contaso dot local. Um, the distinguished name of any particular organizational unit you want these systems to drop into and the name and passwords of your domain join account. And that's really all you need to set this up. Uh, once you have that in here, what will happen is it will, as it builds, it'll also kick off uh, this watchdog process. And what that's going to do is to make sure um, things are actually working before it really tries to fully deploy. So it's gonna go check that, you know, DNS can resolve the Active Directory do you know, domain. Um, you can actually get an IP address. Uh, these, you know, you know, is there a device sync? Which is interesting too. If you watch this on the first run, what this will do is make a uh, a dummy computer object in uh, an Active Directory, and so that way it knows that it can create an object and synchronize back. So it's pretty, you know, it's, it's pretty comprehensive. Once this is all done and your network, your on-premises network connection has completed um, you know, it'll be listed there with either check successful or checks with warning. Uh, I'm usually getting warnings if it's unhappy with how recently AD Connect is synchronized. Uh, that seems to be one of the the, the biggest you know, things that it squawks about. But that's going to give our, our machine an IP address and where it's going to live. Then the next thing we need to do is configure what's called a provisioning policy. And so what we can do here if we create a provisioning policy, is first we need to tell it which network connection we're going to go on to. And so I'll go ahead and take cloud network, and then we get to select which image that we want to use to build said machines. And so we can use either a gallery image, which is going to be our, our Microsoft provisioned and already optimized images. Um, this is actually kind of neat too that they have optimized these, including with some optimizations for Teams, since Teams in VDI runs just a wee bit differently than uh, Teams on-premises. They've already made some tweaks to the image. So, you know, if you're happy with, you know, Windows 10 or Windows 11 and, you know, the Office Office suite, that's easy enough to go ahead and go ahead and take. Uh, conversely, you can also use a custom image. Uh, I have one uploaded in here already, just when I was kicking the tires on this. Um, if you've been making golden images for, let's say, AVD, and you've been using multi-session, you can't, um, use a multi-session SKU Windows image with Windows 365. It is an enterprise-only SKU. And so 
you know, you're not going to be able to just to you know, automatically port over your AVD images again if you have any in there. If not, then it's no big deal. Um, to capture the image, you essentially just build an Azure virtual machine, install what you want, do a sysprep, and then capture, and then stick the thing in your um, your image gallery, and then it can go ahead and bring them down into Windows 365. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and roll just with the, the gallery image uh, just to complete the wizard. So at this point, we've now told it where it's going to live, yeah, which network it's going to attach to, what image is it going to be built with, and then assignments. Um, which users are going to get this provisioning policy. And so when it comes to users, this is the second half of getting the, the machine built. Um, we can go ahead and assign this to whatever user group we want, next create, and they can start cranking out the images. Now, what's important to know, though, is when you add your users, the users also need to have the license provisioned. If either one of those is missing, it can make the machine, but it's not going to be accessible. Um, or if you have a user license but no policy, the user will show up in there, but there's not a machine provisioned. But you can still see at your dashboard who's um, who's got a license applied or a provisioning policy. Once they have both, boom, the machine just starts rolling out. Um, it's been my experience, it takes about 20 minutes for them to, to, to be made, which really isn't bad at all. And then, um, you know, review and create. And that's really at the core of how you're going to build these machines. Um, You'll start seeing them starting to populate in here as they start to uh, start to show up. And once they're all checkboxed, they're good to go. It's deceptively easy. Well, not even deceptively easy. It's just easy. Um, what else do we have in here, though? There is a user settings. This spot is currently pretty sparse. I would fully expect uh, more settings. So what we have today, uh, that's very cool, Phil. Windows 365 on Windows 11 running in Safari on an iPad Mini 4. That's that's like one of the yeah, that's BYOD right there. It's pretty neat. Um, but as far as the user setting, what we've got today is we can just you know, enable the user to be a local admin. Um, what else is going to come into here? I don't know. I would imagine that more things will be showing up here as this product matures. Again, the thing to keep in mind too is this thing came out in like the beginning of August. So, you know, it really hasn't had a, a ton of time to mature, but there has been an absolute bunch of excitement about this solution um, from Microsoft, well, from the community um, and internally at Microsoft. They, they see this as a, a very big deal and are putting resources and manpower behind developing this, this solution. Um, any questions on the, the provisioning? Um, so if, if folks have questions they want to ask, they can um, raise their hand. There are, I think, two in the chat that um, that you didn't cover after they were asked. So I can throw those out there now. OK. Um, the first one um, was if you found the upload download speeds to be consistent, if they're fast as advertised. Um, and then it kind of goes on. It dives into the speed for accessing installing Intune apps, if that's any faster, and also accessing storage. So really just access, I think, to the internet and to then everything already in Azure, what, what you've kind of seen there. I haven't done you know, a ton of investigative work on, on up and down speeds. Um, from what I've noticed, it seems to be working pretty well, but you know, I, I haven't really been you know collecting data or running speed tests. So um, Rob, yes, I will show you end user experience for sure. Um, but you know, from what I have seen and I play with, you know, the connectivity seems to be pretty darn great because you're in Azure and you're, you know, right on Microsoft's backbone. So it's definitely better than what typically what you would have at home. OK, awesome. Um, and then the last one was um, if the enterprise license, if you know if that comes with Azure backup. Did the Azure license come with Azure backup? I don't know. So the license that you, so I don't think the Windows 365 license comes with anything besides just the license for the machine. Uh, so any other type of backup rights is going to be, you know, based off of whatever's, you know, bundled, if that's in whatever that you have. But I, I, I don't think that's coming with, you know, as a native option um, with Windows 365. Awesome, thanks. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend that businesses let their employees run these on BYOD? Um, you can. And yeah, I think that's more of a, you know, a, a, more of a security stance. You know, if 
you need to, you know, completely lock down and secure the endpoint, then yeah, BYOD, BYOD is not going to work. Uh, if it doesn't need to be you know, a hardened you know, endpoint, sure, you could use BYOD. It's really, I think it's more of just a business and security stance question than anything purely technical. Um, from a, a responsive use and an overall you know, functionality, it works just fine on all of these things. So, you know, really, that's more of a comfort level. Um, I kind of like doing the BYOD thing, or you know, I, I think it'd be really fun to do is trying to 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 take autopilot and take you know, you know, um, underpowered machines and build them into thin clients. You know, it gives, you know, without, you, know you could just do the the AAD join, deploy the remote desktop client. Uh, set your policies, and then ta-da, that's your endpoint. So you could secure that, but they're not users aren't going to install anything. Um, you could do Teams on there in Office if you wanted to offload that, but then everything else can be on the desktop. Um, but yeah, you know, that, that's really you know, the, the BYOD thing. I mean, it, it's good enough for running on that for sure. It's really again just more of an you know a, an individual company question. Um, but right now though, it is hard to supply them with a PC. So I mean, there's that. Uh, just because it's hard to get hardware. Um, let's see, it does not come with backup. Local PC hard drives will be mapped. Uh, okay. Um, local PC hard drive will be mapped to drives in the VM. Uh, I don't think that, does that, uh, who is that, Jer uh, Jeremy? Uh, I thought I read there that, that that works if you do that with the app, but not the web browser. Um, and then you could also, I think you can turn that, uh, that functionality on and off via group policy. Um, and a lot, how a lot of the configs are being, you know, uh, being um, recommended to configure, to configure because there's, you've seen all the options that we have there within Windows 365. It's pretty sparse. Uh, so from an end user perspective, what does this look like? Um, kind of depends on which portal you're going through. Um, if you're going through the yeah, I'll just go ahead and log back off of here. And so if you're just going to do pure Windows 365, there is a dedicated Windows 365 portal. So it's windows365.microsoft.com. Pretty straightforward, and even I can remember that. Um, so we can go ahead and log in. Can I move this? No. Okay. And so when the user logs in, they can see their their PCs. So this machine that I have my license for is a two two CPU, eight gig RAM, 128 gigabit or gigabyte of storage. Users can, you know, from here uh, bounce their machine. They can rename it to something that makes sense to them. Get some system information and run troubleshoot. And troubleshoot is run some basic diags. Um, Uh, what's also nice too, um, you, know, you can open the browser. I'll show you that here in just a sec. But there's also a link to the various um, clients that end users can do. Uh, note that this remote desktop for Windows is a direct download. This is not a store app. Um, for what that's worth, the one in the app, if I'm not mistaken, the remote desktop client app in the Microsoft Store does not work with that. Um, I'm hopefully somebody can prove me wrong, but I know that this is this is not the one that's published in the store. This is also the same one that you can use with Azure Virtual Desktop. But then so either way, it's yeah, easy enough for your end users to find the apps that they want to do so. Uh, from connection, open in browser. And it's going to ask about what we want to redirect. I mean, this is you know pretty typical uh, RDP type behavior. Uh, there is file transfer. Um, that's useful when you're going through web browser because the web browser clipboard doesn't do file transfer. It can do text. You can do copy paste text, but you can't do files or objects. So if you use file transfer, there's a mechanism that you can uh, upload a file and have it show up in a folder. I'm going to go ahead and hit allow. So Chris, my experience with the store app is no bueno. Yeah, I was, I wasn't, I was pretty sure that that hadn't changed. Uh, we're going to get the second. Log on, and then I just restarted this thing beforehand, before I started the machine, or started a, the session. And we're going to, bang, there's a desktop. 
And apparently I have some account not set up right in there. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a Windows machine. So and then uh, does this one have Office on it? I uh, may not have installed the whole thing. I don't know. Um, so I don't think I did. Yeah, because there's EF. Yeah, there's no Excel. I would have installed that. Um, but yeah, that's you know that particular user experience of connecting in. Um, what do we have over here? Okay, just some other options. Now, if you go the app route, and I already have this installed, then we can see here's remote desktop. So I'm going to go ahead and open up this guy. And I've already logged in, so it, it went ahead and updated my feeds. But we can see that this guy is my Windows 365 machine. These are all my AVD machines and resources. So, you know, if you are using both, uh, the user can access all of those resources from one app. Um, if they're just doing Cloud PC, it shows up there. Um, what's neat too, if you use the use the Windows app, what this will also do uh, is publish this to start. And so we should have here's my Cloud PC, you know, living right there. And then if you're doing Azure Virtual Desktop, oops, let me try to bring that back up. Under AVD, so under the name of the workspace, which I unimaginatively named Workspace One. And here's all the the applications that applications and desktops. And so having the app installed and configured can make it easier for your users to connect if they only know how to go to start. No SSO, no, the only SSO that works as far as I know is uh, an ADFS uh, integrated Azure AD. Um, and is what it is. Um, but yeah, from the user perspective, let me go ahead and launch this guy. And so now I'm now running on all of my monitors. Uh, if you want to try to curb that behavior, like in AVD, there's actual RDP settings that you can configure monitor behavior. Uh, none of that is native in Windows 365. So you're looking at setting policies, either group or um, group or other uh, to, to control that behavior. But, you know, again, it's it's Windows. And it resized pretty nicely. Let's see, we should be able to do like paint, right? Is that going to work? Yay. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's, yeah. Well, with this, at least this particular SKU with eight gigs and two CPU, I mean, it's definitely not a workhorse. Uh, you know, for 3D rendering or GPUs, uh, GPU support is coming as well. Right now, these are all non-GPU based. Uh, but again, too, the thing to kind of keep in mind about with this solution is, yeah, it came out two months ago. You know, and we, we know that Microsoft re uh, gets better after each service pack and reaches uh, peak per uh, peak perfection at version 3.1. So we got a little bit to go. But from the initial gate, this is this is pretty fantastic. Um, behind the scenes. Uh, when this did the initial release, the machines were all running on Gen 1, which meant legacy BIOS. And so if you're watching on Twitter, there was a, a bunch of Mimi cats, you know, yeah, people using that tool and retrieving passwords and whatnot out of memory. Um, well, with the release of Windows 11, the Windows 11 machines you deploy in here are Gen 2. Um, so if you are going to roll this out to production, I uh, highly recommend you use the Windows 11 SKU because that's going to give you UEFI. Um, one of the other, I guess, complaints or gripes about uh, Windows 365 is you didn't have a TPM chip to enable BitLocker. OK, uh, by default, all of these systems are encrypted at rest uh, by Microsoft. But there's also on the roadmap a um, bring you, bring your own encryption keys that you can store and you can manage so that way when the devices are at rest, um, 
they're encrypted and Microsoft couldn't feasibly even access them because they wouldn't have access to the keys. And so that should probably address most of those day one security issues. Of course, you could still tie this in with any of the other, you know, a Defender stack uh, for additional management. But those were, you know, some of the, the two more glaring issues that we had at day one. Um, anything else on the user experience? You know, we can do here. Donna, we have a, a discussion going on in the chat about being able to reboot as a non-administrator. Do you see restart options in there when you're not an admin, if, if you've tested? Uh, I am an admin. Uh, let's see here. Uh, um, if not there, you do have the ability to restart. And so... If, Now, just to make sure, this is not a, a shared machine like a lot nope. of active virtual desktop nope. and uh, multi-user would, would be. So even if they did restart, it's only restarting their cloud instance? Bingo. Yep. Yep. This is one-to-one. -one. This would be, in AVD terms, this would be a persistent desktop or a, person, or a personal. And so, yeah, whatever the, whatever the end user does. Um, to their machine, it will affect nobody else but themselves. Which is a huge benefit. You know, it's one of the, the issues that you have, and it's one of the design discussions we have with AVD is, do your users need local admin? Do they need to install their own software? Well, yes, okay, well, then multi-session is not for you. Um, because, you know, if you install an application on a session host, everybody gets it. And then there's no guarantee on which host anybody is going to be on any given day. So, while the user can install the application on Monday, they may not have it on the machine they get to on Tuesday. And so um, it's a really completely different mindset, which is one of the big values of Windows 365 is everyone just gets their own machine. And I don't care if they crap it up because I can just rebuild it. Um, I don't have to worry about it contaminating everybody else's sessions. I'm kind of curious. So let's just do, since it came up, All right, Google. Let's see how speedy you are. That'll be my Comcast connection. Uh, the process to build a golden image. It's a good question. Uh, in a nutshell, what you're going to do is spin up a Windows 10 Enterprise Virtual Machine in the Virtual Machine pane. Install what you want to, make whatever op optimizations you want to, um, and run sysprep, just like we've been doing for the last I don't know, 20 years. Has it been that long? Um, once it's sysprepped, uh, the Virtual Machine on the overview has a button that says capture we can follow through the wizard and then that image is now available to to be deployed um, or be imported into windows 365. and so in order to obtain this service and utilize it to full extent we need to have four distinct licenses correct uh no you need to have an intune license and the windows 365 license um if you, you know, if you're getting that into a bundle, you know, you're getting Intune along with Config Man, along with Windows 10 Enterprise, along with, you know, whatever you go, something like an E3 stack, yeah, that's part of the bundle. But you really only need the uh, the Intune license for the management and the um, the machine to dictate the size. How about non-Windows updates without a full rebuild? Uh, so like a third-party updating. Uh, that question, I think, is Stuart's. Can we use shared image gallery instead? Yes. Uh, for your image source? Yeah, I can show you what, what that essentially looks like for an importation. Uh, so if we go to device images, add image name, and you have to give it a, a version. And then let's see. 
images must be generalized, one or two, Windows 10 or newer. Uh, so what that's going to do is that should then go ahead and look through the um, your image gallery, then you can select whatever is applicable. Yes, third party vendor apps. Um, so you would need to use some third party patching like patch my PC who just scored DJAM of all people. Congrats to both, by the way. That's that's a, that was a fantastic option. Um, you know, you're using Intune, you know, for you know for your device management, and so you know PMPC can play well, play ball with with Intune. You know, Jordan can absolutely talk about that. You know, I see him smiling there in the chat room as well. Uh, but you know, most most any perspective that you're going to look at from a management of this, you know, you can. Uh, almost equated to any other type of machine that you're managing. So your third party patching, same rules apply. Um, first party patching, rules still apply. App deployment, rules still all apply. Uh, so from a so from a device management perspective, because we've seen the end user experience, it's pretty groovy. Um, what can we do as admins to these machines? Um, well, we can do you know some stuff here, and so the machines all are built with CPC as a uh, prefix, so they can easily be identified and easily put together into groups. Uh, if we go ahead and look at the Donna machine here, uh, a lot of this should look pretty uh, pretty familiar. So you know we can tell that yeah, I'm co-managing because here's all my config man stuff in here. Again, it's just a Windows 10 box. Um, we can kick our sync of policies, we can do our usual management stuff, but what's specific to ABD are these guys, reprovision and resize. And so with resize, what that's going to do is uh, give us our processor, RAM, and storage options, which also need to line up with the licenses applied to the user that's associated with the mission, yeah, to, to the user. Uh, so if they've got licenses for, you know, for CPU and 16 gigs, cool, you can go ahead and do it. Now, um, I only have one license SKU, so I can't demonstrate the resizability. Um, but that's really how you as an admin can go ahead and resize. As a side note, as it stands today, you can resize up, you cannot resize back. Uh, so just as a as an FYI. Uh, so if you're going to go buy a bunch of licenses, buy them cheap because it's easier to upgrade because you can't downgrade. I'm trying to learn. OK. Um, I'm going to keep going on that one, but let's see if we can figure that out. Uh, if there's some time left. Um, so that's resizing. Oh, it's interesting too, is when you do a resize, there's no concerns about user data loss. Uh, even if you expand the volume, because it's just like now, if you expand a VHD, you know, you're just tacking on more space at the end of it, uh, shrinking down, yeah, it doesn't work. Uh, so um, really once the that resizing policy has been put in place, the user can reboot and then on reboot, new machine. Well, more resources. Uh, reprovision that essentially you know rebuilds the machine. So that's going to be looking at your provisioning policy, the image, the network that it's on there. So if somebody really craps up the machine, they can't get in. Okay, <laughs> reprovision. Um, you've got that ability. Uh, but outside of like those uh, on the um, into I mean everything else is still. Windows 10 management, which is um, pretty cool. Is there a way to apply MSDN credits for Windows 635 versus a credit card for POCs? Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, I don't think so. I know they've been pretty st they've been pretty um, pretty tight on you know trial licenses. So you may be forced if you want to do a POC, you may have to pony up and buy you know a handful of licenses. Uh, are we now able to safely run the feature update from 21H1 to window without bricking the VM? As far as I know, uh, I set the policy on there last night. It looks like it hasn't taken effect yet. So um, it's a good question. Uh, what else do we have? From a reporting perspective, we can look at our endpoint analytics. 
Uh, which endpoint analytics, if you've played around in here, um, you know, it gives you an idea of how your your machines are running all, you know, holistically. We can see app crashes, boot up times, times for group policies, uh, startup scripts, that kind of fun stuff. There is a work from anywhere uh, metric. Uh, now that what that is supposed to do is kind of give you an idea of how how well your systems are working from anywhere over the internet if they're getting really crappy internet connections. Um, I could, yeah, so there's a, oh, I guess where that one was the, the cloud PC only. The two of these were cloud PC only. Ah, here you go, resource performance and then remote connections. That's what they are. All right, cool, my bad. So your, your resource performance. And so this is a Windows 365 specific, um, show you how well your your cloud PCs are running, um, what kind of spikes you're getting. You know, it's a good metric if you've under under provisioned machine size. Now I'm not using them, so I have no CPU spikes because I don't have anybody doing anything on there. I really should try eating, you know, eating my own dog food by running my day to day in there. I just haven't gotten there yet. But we can also see, you know, the model performance. So, OK, there's our cloud PCs. You know your score. Okay, you can export that as a CSV. You know your individual performance. The other thing you got too is your remote connections. How you know how long is it taking uh, connections to get from the machine from the user to the cloud PC and back? Which is good diagnostic if somebody's complaining that their cloud PC. Oh, I I need a I need a faster machine because our 16 gigs of RAM will will absolutely do it. Well, yeah, but your your latency your round trip is you know, 1500 milli, you know, milliseconds. I don't think a CPU or RAM is going to fix that. So you at least get some idea. Um, and so if folks are complaining, you can you know, have a gist of if, if it's a if it's a them, if it's a you or if it's a Microsoft, which is you know, pretty handy. And again, based model and model um, from the security standpoint, we've got our baselines. There is now a Windows 365 security baseline, um, which we can go through and create the profile, make changes. But this one is a spe one specifically tailored for cloud PC. Uh, as always, when you're using a security baseline, test that before you roll it out to prod because you're not quite sure uh, what can break because that's one of the fun things with policy. Um, what else? App deployment is app deployment is app deployment. So anything that you've got in here today, you should be able to go ahead and deploy out. Um, Win32, MSI, Office uh, should work just fine. So yeah, from that perspective, it's it's no different than any of your other machines. Um, trying to think if there's anything else that's uh, yeah, super important. I know I think I've touched on just about darn near everything. So. Um, Yeah, I think at this point I'm good with doing, yeah, opening the floor. Awesome. I've been trying to keep an eye on questions and which ones you've answered along the way. I think we're good between you and a few helpers you have uh, in the audience. Yep. Thanks for everybody who's been helping out in the chat, by the way. That's that's much appreciated. Um, so I know a couple folks in the audience have already been using Windows 3. Oh, I know what I want to show you guys, too. If you haven't tried this out yet and you um, are um, not allowed to buy licensing, uh, you can you do an interactive demo. So interactive demo and you can just Google if you go demo Windows 365, you can land here. And so then you can walk through either the, the business demo or OK, that's enough out of you. Uh, but, you know, you could go ahead and kick the tires and see what that's like. So if you want to try to pitch this or talk about that internally uh, at your at your organization, uh, you have that as a, as a tool so you can familiarize yourself on that. Um, and one thing I wanted to show you, too, on pricing. Now, with, you know, AVD, you know, the, one of those first questions is, well, how much is this going to cost me? And it's tricky when you start talking multi-session. It's a little bit easier when you're talking, you know, uh, a not, you know, a persistent or a, a personal machine. So just for fun, I went into the into Azure pricing calculator and comparing 
the SKU that I have. So I've got a, a two CPU, eight gig, you know, eight gig of RAM machine. Uh, so selecting that as a um, a D2, a D2S V3. I'm not 100% sure which specific classes are running on the back end. They don't make that really easy to find. So finding a similarity. Uh, if we left this machine running 24 seven, it's going to be 70 bucks a month. Compare that to Windows 365. You're looking at, you know, um, if you're using the hybrid benefit, you know, 41 bucks a month if you go 128 or 50 a month. So clearly, if these things are going to run 24 7, Windows 365 would make more sense. But, you know, you, but since with AVD, you can take advantage of the consumption. So as long as you stay on this, if these machines only run 12 hours a day, okay, this will cost you 35 bucks. So, you know, there's, while, you know, on its face, sure, AVD is going to be cheaper. We still need to think about those. Yeah, you know, those hidden costs or those, you know, soft costs. Yeah, you know, we need to build you know, our scale up scripts. We need to have policies to handle shutdown, uh, booting users out because it won't, you know, if you're using a scaling script with a, set, a multi session, it won't kick users out unless you forcibly tell it to. Uh, or and if you don't, uh, you can still set a policy to force log off disconnected sessions. Um, so there's a lot more managerial overhead. That goes in with AVD because you need to set your log analytics, your automation accounts, uh, all this other fun stuff that you just don't have with Windows 365. Windows 365, I mean, you you saw the whole thing. It's that's what you get, and there's a 99.9% SLA the redundancy within the region, um, and so you can really just start deploying once you plunk your licensing down versus going through something like an AVD where you would need to plan out all of this other underlying infrastructure and have your strategies to, to mitigate costs. So um, I just thought it was kind of interesting to compare uh, some, some folks have had sticker shock with uh, $41 a month. Good Lord. Well, yeah, but what what does a laptop cost you for three years of ownership, you know, per month uh, or what is another solution going to cost per month and how much effort do you need to get in there to make it cheaper? So, yeah, which one is going to be the best fit? I don't know. That's that's a you answer, not a me answer. But Windows 365 should actually be part of that discussion and equation. Yeah, Donna, to add to that, we just um, we went through a whole cost benefit analysis with um, a lot of consultants who just do money for a living, I guess. And and you start adding in there, well, what is the cost for your technician to replace it when that board dies and when the hard drive dies, and all of those costs go away too. Mm-hmm. Yep. Shipping machines back and forth. Shipping loaners. Um, yeah, you don't have that if it's BYOD and that's on the end user to go to Best Buy and go buy something. Um, yeah, but the, yeah, those soft costs and the hidden costs are, are they're tricky to quantify, but they're absolutely there. Um, you know, it seems you know IT shops are still being asked to do more with less people and less budget. So the less stuff that you have to keep an eye on, the less that you have to do. Um, any other? Questions in there. Uh, laptops getting stolen, also very true. Yeah, you don't have to worry about them getting stolen. Um, so I think that's I about. Some, I saw what? some questions about um, sovereign clouds. Is it supported in Azure government or um, other sovereign clouds? Uh, I am not sure. Uh, I honestly, I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some restrictions on there. Um, I'm pretty sure that right now it's probably just public cloud. I'm not sure what the certific certifications it needs to do to do gov yet, but that's a good question. I don't know if this plays well in China yet either. Awesome. It looks like things are starting to wrap up. So. Um with the with the questions, so I'll I'll say on behalf of the entire community, thank you, Donna. That was awesome. Oh, you're welcome. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah, that that was great. I learned a ton, and uh, and I have been playing with this, and there were things in there that that I didn't know. So thank you. Um, and again, for those who who joined late, we did record this, um, and I think that somebody also posted links to all of Donna's um, blogs and her Twitter and everything in the chat as well. Uh, but we'll we'll post that with the video, and we'll post on the website, and on the Win Admins Twitter, and everyone else. So we'll we'll make sure everybody knows how to get in touch with Donna, but hopefully not for support. 
Oh, no, please. Um, yeah. Yeah. If you follow me on Twitter, you just ping me. You got questions. I'm, I'm happy to have those discussions. So, yeah, if, if you're stumped on something, you know, you, know, you can reach out. You know, there's still plenty of other people in the community that are working with this as well. So don't be a stranger. Awesome. Thank you. Um, 